Boy, do we have some topics today. We have social media being worse than a record deal. Don't pay just any artist for a feature and expect that actually to turn out well. We also got to talk about Twitter versus threads and the war going on. There's also a sneaky entrant that might be taking over the game soon. We'll let y'all be the judge and some other cool topics to get right to y'all with. But first, what's up everybody? I'm Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. This episode was actually not supposed to be an episode, but we ended up making a clip that was too long. So now it will be an episode. <laughs> of course, catch us every Tuesday and Thursday on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you stream your podcast here at the intersection of creativity and currency i'm not gonna do the rest of it because you just about to go right into this clip that we just recorded and it went too long but it's a great episode i promise you let's start off with this statement being on social media is worse than signing a bad record deal run that clip mm. Look at the music industry as these artists, they signed their rights away. They gave away their masters or these different executives. They took advantage of these artists. And I would never do that if I was in a position that I would always control my master. You signed your masters away for free. If you're on right. social media, you agreed to let them use your content, repurpose your content, however they feel free. You agreed to promote their platform. You're actually making content for them, which they're selling ads against, and you're not getting paid anything. And you've never questioned it one time. So anything that's free, you're the product. That's like an artist going into the studio for 10 hours a day and making an album every single week and never receiving one royalty. Because that's what we're doing. You think you're just making a post, you're making content that they're selling ads against. If there's no platform and nobody's making content, Content, then there's no revenue model for them to make money from. You never thought about it like that. You're literally working for them and you've yep. never got paid for it. You don't own your content. You gave the rights away as soon as you signed up for it. And you want to complain about Diddy. Y'all got 360 deals for free and you okay with that. And I've never heard one person complain. Think about it. They tricked you to think that this is all fun and games or you call you a content creator or influencer or just a regular person. You got 300 followers, 500 followers. It doesn't matter. You're still making content. You are are the product. They are the business. You're working for them for free. You don't have any control of what they do. You can't control who you reach. You don't control your content and you're not getting paid. Now, mm -hmm. there is a truth in the fact that if the product is free, you are the product, mm -hmm. right? We've seen that time and time again. That is the model of the internet. User generated content is where we hit scale. But I disagree with a whole lot of this shit, right? Yeah. Same. Just because of the sensitive topic of actually being in the industry, uh, seeing what artists' deals look like, and the choice you have to wake up and create social media and, and be on there, right? Yeah. So yes, I think it rings true that for sure, yes, they use your content. Yes, they have rights to continue to use your content. You're helping build their platform 100%, right? But one, they're building it on the aggregate of everybody popping out. And, and being active on the platform, they're not building it on the individual head of the artist and I go on a tour and now I just individually sold these tickets and then you're taking my shit, right? Yeah. Like that's one thing. But let's like look at what real deals really look like when we talk about artists. One, you're in the deal and it's contractually obligated for you to be able to, like for you not to be able to leave that deal mm -hmm. until you have a certain amount of metrics you you hit, right? Yeah. You also are getting a loan. There's no loan occurring on social media, yeah. right? Yeah. That you then have to pay back to get your, 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 uh, your music to be owned by you again. Or shit, you might've given away your ownership on top of the fact that you took a loan against it, right? On social media, dog, Yes, they might be able to use your, your content, but you still own the content. Mm -hmm. Like there is more licensing than than anything, right? Now that might not be the technical term when you get into the real legal, you know, uh, aspect of things, but you still have the ability to take your content on different platforms. You have the ability to stop posting. You have the ability to like literally delete your content and it not be seen on those platforms for the most part, generally speaking. On top of that, the opportunities, they blew up on social media. Rashad, who's speaking? We have bl blown up and built a massive um, like base on social media. So the opportunity to me is, is so different. You can't say that it's worse. Now, if you said like there's some resemblance, you know, that's not as viral as a statement. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Or you say, shoot, there are some aspects of it and or it just sucks like bro they kind of screwing you over and just leave the record deal out of it 
then I'm all with that. But once you compare it to a record deal and how bad these record deals really are and how you actually lock down and they taking your life and your product, nah, bro, it, it's, it's different. Yeah, I agree. Because I, I think that's the part that's not thought about, like the, the long-term ownership aspect. Because, you know, I've taken my TikToks and posted them on Instagram. We, we've used them on the YouTube channel. And they, I, as far as I'm concerned, or as far as I know, I haven't received any letters in the mail mm -hmm. telling me to stop. Versus if I was an artist and I recorded a song with Atlantic and I try to take that shit to Columbia, it is not going down like that. You know, not yes. without some type of very intense legal battle. Yep. Um, And then I think... To the point about not being paid for the content, I don't know. I think that's it's, it's really similar to the, the streaming model in a sense. Like, I give them that, right? Like, hey, if you're a creator with 500 followers, you're not getting paid as much as the creator with 500,000 followers. Just like if you're an artist with 1,000 monthly listeners, you're not getting paid as much as the artist with 10 million monthly listeners. Or like, not at all on social media. There's, yeah. there's a lot of people who aren't getting paid on the, at all on social media. Yeah, exactly. Point. Yeah. And, you know, which... I get, it, man. You know what I'm saying? It's a battle of, att of attention. Like we we gonna pay who gains us the most attention. Which, like I said, that's the only real similarity I kind of see between data and music. Is like you know what I'm saying, like, right. but that goes back to the creator and then the artist themselves, right? right? Because every artist isn't going to get 10 million monthly listeners, just like every content creator is going to get a million followers. You know what I'm saying? It's just the, the reality of the nature, and you know what you're dealing with now. I will give them this. I think both industries are similar in the fact that they are both pushing for the creators to monetize their audience and not really look at the platform to pay them, right? Instagram was like, hey, bro, get these motherfuckers to give you these badges, right? Set up these subscriptions, you know what I'm saying? Get your fans to pay you. Same way labels are like, yo, bro, go go build community, man. Go sell some experiences. Go go put X, Y, Z together, merch and stuff that you can sell to them. Those, those two similarities I see, Beyond that, when you talk about the ownership of things, the licensing, to your point, how long you're contractually obligated to these people, that is what makes it vastly different. And then check this out. <laughs> he threw out the term 360, saying we're complaining about Diddy, but then we already signed in 360s for free. That is not the same. Yeah. If I am an artist and I'm in a 360 deal, I'm dropping music on this streaming platform, got it. That's my money. And then I drop some merch, got it, that's my money. I do a tour, got it, that's my money. The label is taking a piece of all of that. But if I'm on Instagram and then I go drop some content on TikTok or YouTube and I get make some YouTube ad revenue, Instagram's not taking that money. Mm -hmm. If I go drop some merch on Shopify, Instagram's not taking that money. If I go do a live show, the show that we're doing on August 12th, coming soon, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> make sure that y'all check out this show. We're gonna give y'all free game, artist, Marketing in person, me, Ja'Cory, J.R. McKee, who has a Grammy, literally just helped the artist get over 300 mil million streams recently. But I digress. <laughs> they don't get none of that money of this show we're about to do. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, no yeah. labelsnecessary.com, by the way, y'all check that out. It's not only 60 people that can be there. Like, So it's a vastly different uh, agreement. And I think if you consider free marketing cost. And the level of being able to build your business up for the cost of social media is nothing. That's what's allowed so many build businesses to be able to grow mm -hmm. the way they have in a way that you couldn't do in the past. I have distribution for free to get this attention in ways that I never could before. Yes, they might be monetizing it. Now, when you get into privacy and how people feel around that, that's a different conversation. Right. And what data you want to be seen or not. But in terms of just the sheer opportunity, when we're talking about economics, because that's what he's really referring to more the economics of a record deal versus mm -hmm. a, um, a social media deal, if you will. The economics for the individual who's trying to actively use it as an entrepreneur, especially a business person, far outweigh the economics of a record deal. Yeah. So that's the point that I, I kind of was thinking about, too. Like, I'm wondering if Rashad was speaking on. Like the actual content creators that really do get deals, because we know, man, like certain platforms will strike deals with certain creators once they reach a certain level, but that's like 1% of the influencer, mm -hmm. the influencers in that base. If he's talking about them, I get it. If he's talking about just like the everyday content creator, you know what I'm saying? Like to your point, the one that's making videos to grow his business, but you know, he don't know he might pop in three months and, and get 500,000 followers out of nowhere. It's not the same. It's not even close to the same. <laughs> no, nah, it's not. It's not. It's not. But keep on posting and, and, and bringing out those takes, man. I, I appreciate their, their content. But that one, nah. 
can't let that one run, man. A 360 deal is is, is, is just crazy, a whole bro. another. That's a whole another thing than social media. You know what I'm saying? And it would be wild for us to all be using social media, and they wouldn't be using social media if it really was as bad as a 360 deal. But let's get into this next topic because we spent way longer than we were on on on, uh, on on most topics. TJ's DJ. Shout out to TJ. If y'all know TJ, he is Bob's manager, Trap Backwards manager. He said, if you pay an artist for a feature, make sure you get clearance from the label so you can release it. I see all kinds of artists pay for features that they can't ever release because it wasn't cleared. If they do release it, it will be immediately removed from all DSPs and radio stations with a simple cease and desist letter. What is he saying? Yo, if you get a feature from Chris Brown randomly, but then his label has no idea about this, it can easily be blocked by the label. That's not anything official. You need to make sure it's cleared. So all these deals y'all think, oh, I got a feature. I got a feature. Eh, do you really? Or is it just a feature that you can show at the family reunion on your Walkman or something? You know what I mean? Because once that thing's on the streaming platform, that shit ain't going. He's on your Walkman? I'm sorry, bro. I'm sorry, I don't man. know where that came yeah, from. Bro. You know, sorry, we're going to let that ride. But no. <laughs> But no, you're right, man. And and artists have to stop letting bigger artists finesse them into buying these features that mm-hmm. they're not going to get clear. Because I've I've seen that. Right? I, I do think there's a portion of artists that don't care. They're willing to shoot the shot, see yep. if I can slide it through. You know, probably hoping that the song catches attention to the point to where the label's like, eh, we'll let that rock. You know what I'm saying? But the reality of it is, bro, it's really the bigger artists finessing the smaller artists. Hey, bro, I thought you this 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 this, this deal. Um, you know what I'm saying? We not going to go through. The label at all. It's just gonna be me and you, and then shit gonna be cool. And then you don't gave, I don't wanna say Chris Brown, I don't wanna ruin him like that, but it's just like you gave who, whoever, big who the fuck, whatever, you know what I'm saying, 50 bands thinking mm-hmm. you getting the deal, and then, you know what I'm saying, you get cut out two months later by the label, and they not give you the money back. They did their part of the transaction, right? They they did what they were supposed to do. You just didn't know the game, and yep. then you, you ass out or whatever you paid. So, and yeah, bro. Like, and this is what will happen. And I first heard this from an artist that, you know, that I know he got a feature from an artist that pretty much all of y'all would know. And he was like, 50 bands is the price of this feature if you want it. But he was willing to give it all up. It's damn near his life savings, 50 bands. However, if you pay this shit in cash, mm. I'll give it to you for 30 bands. Red flag. Hey, man, <laughs> I've been saving this 50K all my life. It'd be nice to hold on to 20K of that. So I'm going to pay for that. Who's not going to go with that deal? You still gonna get the exact same thing for less money. I just gotta pay it cash instead of credit card or whatever. Now, if you're not thinking about refunds and and like having to be to be able to like call the bank and say, hey, that's not official, then whatever. But like, who's not gonna take that deal? So why are artists doing that? Why would a major artist do that? One, if I put this do this shit officially on my side, well, label coming. I gotta pay the money the label. Yep. I don't want the label to get any of this money. And depending on the artist's deal, out of that 50K, I might only be keeping maybe 10K, maybe 20K. So why don't I just charge you 30K, keep all that to myself, just like the candy at the gas station. I don't know if you know that. A lot of people at the gas station, like a lot of these gas stations or when they get paid cash, candy is one of the main things that they would use for, particularly back in the day, when they get paid cash, they don't report that. And that's why the candy was like so profitable for them because they don't and they keep that to the side. It's like I just bought this off the damn near candy lady, or you like you're not really tracking the inventory right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, so it's a similar effect. It's like that inventory can't be tracked. Nobody knows. And then if something pops up and the labels are like, yo, where'd this come from? I don't know what happened. I don't know where that came from. You know, these producers just be taking my <laughs> my joints and leaking them out to everybody trying to do a flip i never said anything about that we don't have it on paper right yeah. no paperwork no system transactions none of that stuff all cash can't be tracked so like tj said hey if it's not cleared then shoot man it didn't happen it never happened. It never <laughs> happened, bro. Again, say that for your for your homies to brag at the family reunion or the, or the next meetup. Next clip, though. We got to talk about this Twitter war, this Threads war, because it's getting interesting. And Gino the Ghost, he's I've seen a couple clips from his podcast, man. It seems to be pretty dope. 
And he's having an interesting conversation about Twitter and Elon Musk. I want to talk about threads. So <laughs> The game changer. <laughs> the, the Twitter killer. Yeah. Uh, Twitter's not going anywhere unless Elon literally kills it. But I do think the reason threads has legs. What other social media app have you got on and instantly had like thousands of followers not having the daunting nature of having to grow another following yeah will make the app feel like i'm not screaming into the void you're a producer i'm a director there's a bit of this that's nerdy so let's get very nerdy let's get nerdy um there's a book called the 22 immutable laws of marketing one of like the main laws is the first one there owns the territory coke is the first cola you can never overtake coke but coke can fuck up like when coke became new coke pepsi actually had that moment another one about knowing where you stand if you're number two play as number two positioning yeah so pepsi's whole thing was based on being number two and then they didn't know how to adjust so they actually let coke re get back to being coke when they said oh no fuck new coke we're back to being coke and everybody said okay we'll just pretend that didn't happen the question is was twitter's move over to elon uh, the mainstream saying you're now a right-wing platform enough of a fuck up or enough of a shift that people will go to threads. All right, so there's a couple of things in that video. First of all, that whole positioning, he references to, uh, to 20 immutable laws of marketing. Really great book, y'all check that out. The number two strategy is a very real thing. See, in racing or being like through, in school, number two is a loss. But in real life and business, number two is a great position a lot of times because a lot of marketplaces at least need one alternative. So he mm -hmm. said Pepsi and Coke, you got Uber and Lyft. Uh, mm -hmm. You could be a billion dollar number two business yeah. and ride that out. Like yeah. most businesses have a number two, right? Um, Google and then you look at what it was Internet Explorer and Yahoo, like there's always gonna Bing. be those, Bing, right? There's always gonna be the loiterers who can just stand by and catch the drift and, and end up getting some money. By the way, I realized like a week ago, why catch your, my drift is catch my drift, like drifting and racing. Yeah. I, was, I never put that together. So. <laughs> The thing I disagree with, though, or is a lot of people feel like Elon's fucking Twitter up. But then if you look at what he said he wanted to do from the very beginning, he actually didn't want to make Twitter better. He wanted to create this whole X.com super app idea. So... He said the Twitter killer, only Elon Musk can kill Twitter. I, I believe the same thing. Mm -hmm. right? I don't. I think a lot of the pushback and, and um, the conflict that people are having with Twitter and saying it's not like that anymore and is the fact that he really doesn't want it to be like that. Yeah. He, had, he said he has this idea of an app, right, this super app, and he said it would take like maybe nine years to bring it to fruition if he built it from ground zero. But if he bought Twitter, he'd think he can accomplish it in like four or five or some shit like that. That was what um, what I remember him saying from the very beginning. So we should expect more of Twitter not being around or like downsizing. And then maybe that's why like Mark wasn't just looking like, let's take advantage of this moment. Like Pepsi took advantage of the new Coke moment, mm -hmm. which was a wild thing for new Coke to do, like trying to fix something that, that wasn't broke. I think he might also understand, no, this is something worth deep um, deep diving in because not only is there a weak moment and a need because people are looking to, to go to an alternative. I don't want to be on this right ring person app or who I perceive to be white ring. I want to, so where's my alternative? He also is like, no, this is actually about to be a real business void, possibly, depending on where Elon goes with this old super app shit. Mm, yeah, I can see that. I can see that. And I, I do think they made a good point, too, about why threads are so popular, right? It's all just shiny object syndrome. Mm. It's a new platform. One of the most intimidating things about Twitter is Twitter's a very hard platform to grow on. So if you ain't, if you yeah, ain't been on are. Twitter... Since like 2008, nine, and you you start today, 2023, moving forward. So it's a very hard game to jump into. And that's intimidating for most people, right? We think about just, even if we just narrow it down to all the Gen Z kids that just decide to try to become, you know what I'm saying, Twitter influencers. They, they got a 15, you know what I'm saying, year, like uh, they had a 15 year gap, you know what I'm saying, between the people that's been building right. for a minute. What's the growth and, strategy? How do I grow on Twitter? Exactly. And then here comes threads. And to that point, it's easy to get followers. You can just invite your, 
your Instagram following over. So if you already have a decent to big following on Instagram, then you had a couple thousand followers within minutes. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like I know when I set my threads up, I was at a couple hundred within like 10 minutes. You know what I'm saying? Just inviting all my people to follow me. So it, it, it appeals to that that dopamine receptor part of your brain that likes quick hits and quick growth. Mm -hmm. And I think Instagram knows that and that's a large part of the reason why they put it into it. But now once we get past that, you know what I'm saying? Then what can we say it really offers that Twitter doesn't offer? Um, and I'm thinking about this from a couple of different things. I, I remember seeing some report that said like threads, user base dropped by like 80, 90% or something after like the first week or two, right? So we all was on it from shiny object syndrome and we all was kind of like, eh, it's really just Twitter. And then, you know, the people that like Twitter went back, the people that never cared for it stopped using it anyway, because I'm, I'm one of those. I didn't care for Twitter, so I'm not enticed by a new Twitter, you know what I'm saying? And then on top of that, it was just like a month ago or four or five months ago when everybody was like, oh, Instagram needs to go back to photos and videos. And so now <laughs> y'all want me to believe y'all are hype about this text feature when yeah. half a year ago y'all were saying that Instagram needs to abandon everything that's not photo. Mm -hmm. So even the user base opinion on it isn't all the way stabilized. They don't know what the fuck they want <laughs> from yeah. Instagram. And so that's enough for me to say like, nah, Twitter ain't going away. Like you say, unless Elon... Kills it off. It's the only way. He's the only one that could put the bullet to, to, the, to the head and, and take it out. You know what I'm saying? Facts. I mean, as a, a full-blown culture, I don't know about that, right? Because yeah. there's already a different culture on Instagram. So you're just pulling a feature of Twitter, but you can't copy Twitter's culture. Exactly. Right? Just like you can't copy TikTok's culture. And I don't think they want to, man. Twitter culture is toxic. No. You can't. That's, that took years to build, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they've invested a long time in, in, in that. But... I think the utility still is going to last in it, unlike IGTV, because at the very least you have all these people who are using Twitter, reposting from Twitter onto Instagram, yeah. the screenshots. So any business person especially, or one of those people who do quotes and things like that, they're probably going to use threads just because it's easier. Yeah, right, right there. Right? So why do I not continue to do that? Hype culture, I don't know, but business utility and actually beneficial for the platform, I think it's a great add-on. Killing Twitter, last thing I'll say on that is, X. wasn't it just Zach this morning that just mentioned the fact that they're getting rid of like the Twitter logo and all that stuff? Yeah, they're changing it to X. Yeah, so they're changing it to X. So like I said, the X.com shit was the shit he wanted to do from the very beginning, right? So he's doing that. It'll be cool to see uh, like that transition in general just to watch like a real-time case study because... There's a lot of brand equity in Twitter, and a lot of people don't like that. But companies die every day, B. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it just is what it is. We know it's not super been uh, profitable. They know it's been struggling. So uh, we might have an emotional attachment to it and think it's so hard to build this up. But he's a billionaire. He's not like doing it just for that. He has a different fit, a different vision. And when it comes down to it, like Twitter is. No, I'm gonna say I'm, I'm gonna say that. But at the very least, he does have the IP of, of Twitter, and we'll see the cool shit that happens with Twitter. Like people might be wearing like Twitter like merch in about five years or whatever, depending on what the company does with it. Mm -hmm. Next topic. This is an interesting one. It's about making money and it not solving your problems emotionally. Yeah, that's deep, man. Yeah, we going deep, bro. We going <laughs> deep. All right, Jim Carrey once said. I wish everybody reaches every single goal that they have so they can realize that none of that matters. I made more money than I ever thought I would ever make in one year. I thought that was the missing piece, right? Because happily married, I got kids. And so I said, wow, I need to make millions of dollars, right? Because if I make millions of dollars, I don't know. I just thought something would change. Mm. It actually made me depressed. Like, it, it made me feel bad. Like, I, I expected, you know, I was running a race, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm looking back and I'm running and I'm like, oh, I see the, I see the, 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 the red tape and I run through the red tape and I just think that there's going to, I don't know. I don't know. I thought it was going to be confetti. I thought there was going <laughs> to be the crowd. I thought it was going to be something. Um, and there's more pressure being successful than kind of flying under the radar. That's a fact. What'd you think about that? I don't know, man. It's always such a weird thing when rich people try to 
convince me that money doesn't mean a lot. It's I'm like like it's, it's easy to say from where you at. You know what I'm saying? Like I like I'm not I'm not I'm not broke. I'm not poor, but you know I'm not rich. Like, I can afford a ten piece a couple times a week. You know what I'm saying? Like if I if I choose to, and I feel like that's a good position to be in. And I've seen the studies where what is it? They say your level of happiness doesn't really rise once you hit I think like 150k a year or something like that. It used to be 60k, but with inflation, it's probably yeah, like somewhere, somewhere around there. Yeah. yeah. So and I can I can see that you know what I'm saying just kind of just thinking about certain things where it's like all right once your basic needs are met and then you can like afford to splurge on like little things like the average person doesn't want to go out and just buy like a bunch of Lamborghinis you know what I'm saying the average person is cool with like hey I can eat out two or three times a week I can buy the playstations every time they drop and I can afford to like travel, you know what I'm saying? Which mm -hmm. isn't like, that's not a, a crazy amount of money to be able to do that, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I do think that 80, 90% of people would be perfectly fine with that. Mm -hmm. So I, but I don't know, man, like I said, it's, it's always weird when rich people try to tell me that this shit don't matter. It's like, well, give me some then. And their immediate response is no. And it's like, all right, that's all I need to know. It's everything I need to see. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> to me, like, I think it's always simple, right? I want. I only look for money to solve money problems. Yeah, definitely. finance solves finance problems. The emotional shit, I can't expect it to solve that. And even then, you can afford therapy, so it kind of can. See, the therapies ain't therapy ain't cheap, man. That that, that is true. <laughs> now, does therapy solve problems or make you want to sit in them? It depends on the therapist. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. You know what I mean? But there's some unpopular opinions. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> therapy can get you a daycare so your kids can leave the house. I mean, not yeah. therapy. Money can get you a daycare that's, so your kids can leave problem, the house. That's a money problem, right? Okay, fair. It's a money problem. But the kids are an emotional problem. The kids can be an emotional <laughs> problem. I agree. The thing, is, the thing about that, though, is once you have all these problems solved financially, now people only have themselves to blame. Like, yeah. shit, what is it? So you've been telling yourself... Oh, it's because I can't get these kids out my way or because I don't have time for myself or because I can't afford this. And once those things are solved for, now you're like, damn, why am I still tripping? Mm -hmm. and then you realize you got all this trauma and you've been seeing things all weird. And then you realize, dang, man, like, do I even like myself? You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. how do I even solve not liking myself? Because I've been blaming the world instead of taking accountability for what I do, I I remember I tell my kids, I'm like, oh, daddy, I'm bored. I'm like, dang, why are you so boring? I'm like, cause I'm never bored when I'm by myself. I gave it like two minutes. I said, you still bored? It's like, oh no, I'm not bored no no more. I'm like, why? What'd you start to do? Started to think about some kind of like imagine, use her imagination. <laughs> she found a way not to be bored by herself. I'm like, that's see, there it is, right there. <laughs> Find ways to like and entertain yourself without other devices, material things. So that's the way I look at it. <laughs> oh, she looking like, man, daddy can leave the house when he feel like it. He be coming back home with food. That's what happiness look like. That, that, that is the mentality you had when you were a kid. Yeah. Like, I thought happiness looked like when I could finally afford fruit gushers, I can get all the cereal that I wanted to because my dad said, no, nah, we can't afford cereal. And I thought we, that just meant we were broke, broke. But apparently that just meant that I ate too much cereal and I can't afford to pay, keep paying for as much cereal as you want, bro. Like, but like that was what I saw money as, bro. Like, I was like, I could get all these little like random, random snacks. And if you got like soap in a dispenser in your house, oh, bro, you got money. That's how I used to look at it. Yeah, I, I feel that. And I, I do think one of the points, because he kind of touched on it right where he was like, you know, sometimes it's happier. I, I, I don't know exactly what he said, but like he mentioned being able to fly under the radar versus when you got money, you kind of above the radar. That's the last point that matters. Yeah, yeah you know, which kind of touches on the old saying of more money, more problems, right? The more value you are bringing, the more people want to work with you, talk to you, the more just energy is coming your way, which can get stressful. That I 100% agree with, you know what I'm saying? The more money that you have, the more money that you have to lose. Yeah, right? that too. Yeah, you, maintain the lifestyle, the expectation, so I, I get that. Yeah, and it's like, you know, I don't know, man, like I said, it's just, I always go back to it, but it's so weird when people with money be trying to convince me the money ain't gonna ain't gonna fix it. Fix All right, a lot. let's leave it like this. Let's not act <laughs> like we don't have no experience. You know what I mean? In the money category, we all made one level of money before. Yeah. And now we have a certain level of money now. Yeah. We're not necessarily rich or anything like that, but shit. You know, I remember when I was 
like my first paycheck was two hundred dollars. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And then they took like fifty dollars out of that shit for, for taxes. Crazy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, <laughs> and I was like, wait, what? You learn that whole thing. <laughs> then I remember making like fifteen hundred dollars in a month between like two jobs at a time or something like that. Yeah. Or whatever. And having to grind myself to that. I'm trying to think like, did that feel different than where I was when I was working at Pizza Hut? It's, it's, it's interesting because then your responsibilities change if your responsibilities change with it. Yeah. And that's the game I always feel like. It's more about, I look at it as trying to get ahead of of the life that you're about to live, right? Yeah. It's like having 300K in the bank before you have kids is different than having kids with 300K in the bank. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So I don't know. Like have your first job and how much, well, let's just think about how much money you're making four years ago. Let's go there. Right, because we going because I think the first job and the responsibility you had to get at the uh, at that time, you probably were happier in some ways, yeah, or freer in some ways. My first job, I was sweeping hair at a barbershop, making mm-hmm. like I don't know, like fifty dollars a week. But you were freer. Eh. No, the guy I worked for was pretty strict. Oh, yeah. So I, I mean, know. but outside of work though, I'm talking about the oh, yeah, amount yeah, of money yeah, that yeah. you were yeah, making, yeah, yeah, right? Fast, yeah, you know, teenager shit. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. You know, no real responsibility. So think more like yeah. four years ago to now. Are you significantly happier? Because of the amount of money that you you were making now versus then? Yeah, definitely. I can definitely say so. Because I'm trying to think, what job did I have four years ago? That's when I was working at the clothing store. I think I was making maybe like 1800 a month or something like that. Easy. <laughs> All right. And Atlanta was cheaper back then, so I will give it that. Atlanta was cheaper the last time I had a real nine to five. You know what I'm saying? So that could, it could also just be life inflation, you know what I'm saying, and, and trying to keep up with that. Maybe has made me feel a certain way within that, but yeah, I could definitely, I could definitely say so. All right, so I think the only way we can truly speak <laughs> on this experience then would be because like money did make you happier, yeah. which is along the lines of this, right? But now the next point is getting over that curve. That yeah, point exactly. that they say, yeah, like once you get past this point, it don't do much more for you. Yeah, that's all I was gonna say too. Like I, ain't, I didn't have that significant of a jump. Where I was like, oh, I'm, I was making eighteen hundred a month and now, and now I got four hundred k in the bank. Yeah, that, that ain't hit me yet. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. But maybe, maybe. But I think about future me, and future me plans to make that much money, and I see him smiling and laughing and running through fields and shit, man. So I don't know. I don't know. It just might be in between tears and, and lonely <laughs> nights. <laughs> Let's play this last clip from Jason Derulo and we're going to get out of here. Let me see. Jason Derulo has a side business value at $2 billion, apparently. Crazy. Let's listen to this quick clip. How many sources of income do you have? 13. What's the highest? It's a very unsexy business, but it is a monster. It's called Rocket Car Wash. And Rocket Car Wash is basically changing the way that people get their cars washed. It's an amazing facility. You know, you go in and you pay a membership and you can get your car washed at any time. It's kind of like the Spotify motto and how Spotify changed the music industry. It's like Netflix and how Netflix changed the film industry. People want things that are recurring and that they can do anytime they want. I think the point of the fact that he's making this much money doing a business outside of music is a great conversation. And that's what all content creators should be trying to figure out. Like. Mm -hmm. Yo, I'm creating content, whether I'm getting it from YouTube, um, advertising, but how can I create a course or how can I invest my audience and start a makeup business or whatever, or an artist doing the same thing? How do I find other forms of income that are more traditional business and more predictable because we already know the creative economy can go up and down. You're hot. The algorithm's loving you. And then next thing you know, the algorithm breaks up for you and finds that new bitch, right? Crazy. But- at the same time, Rocket Car Wash, <laughs> having a subscription and comparing it to like Spotify and being innovative, like, so that's just like, and this is not less a critique on the idea because I think that idea is beautiful. Everybody should do that. I just want to make one quick comment on that. One, we already know places that do that. Like, so it's interesting. He's probably just not the spokesman for this. Yeah, you know what I mean. So this not has nothing to do with Rocket Car Wash. This is just an artist. Like he, that might be how he got pitched on it. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Like just we just gotta tell him what it'll sell him and bring him in. <laughs> and now he's talking about us. 
cool. Like Justin Derulo ain't washing his own cars. Yeah, Jason ain't washing his own cars. <laughs> but what I do find will be innovative, which I don't know enough about them. Y'all let me know if Rocket Car Wash does this or not. When you really could do it, like if it was like 24-7 and there were no humans involved, like maybe it was just that one person, like some, some you know, watching over yeah. the facility or something. But if I could just slide in, not really have to wait for the man to like tell me, oh, come on up, stop. Like any of that stuff, and I could do this at like one a.m. in the morning if I wanted to, like eight a.m. in the morning if I wanted to, like something like that. Now I think that'll be a little bit more interesting, and as many times as I want to. Now we're getting something interesting. Most of the ones that I know that are on subscription have still. I don't know about complete unlimited. It's like a more amount of times. But if y'all got rid of those workers, now I mean, <laughs> y'all might let me be <laughs> be able to come unlimited. Oh man, you here for the AI? Uh, the AI uh, car no, wash worker? Not, not AI, automation. Mm. You know what I mean? I'm against uh. AI. Don't let AI take over. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I, I see that. I, and, well, first of all, I do want to say playing the Jason Derulo $2 billion business clip after the money it doesn't matter clip is sick. <laughs> <laughs> so whoever put this together is crazy. But um, yeah, no, nah, I think, like you said, that's the bigger point, right? And I, I think a lot of artists would be surprised to learn how many artists don't make majority of their money in music. Because yeah. he, he's not the first to say that or show that. You know, we've seen even people as iconic as like a Snoop Dogg or a Dr. Dre come out and be like, bro, look at all these other businesses I got. The music is really just the marketing. It keeps my brand active so that these other lucrative opportunities continue to come my way. And so whenever I hear artists you know, especially newer artists ask the question like, man, when, is, when am I going to hit the point where I'm making a lot of money from my, my streaming, my music? It's like, that may never happen. You know what I'm saying? Like, you may never hit a point where your music is, is making a large chunk of money, but it doesn't mean that everything else about you won't allow you to enter opportunities where you can still make a lot of money because of the music. You know what I'm saying? So I think it's, it's, it's a narrative that needs to get out there more. I think it's a narrative that would put a lot of artists in a happier place and, and make them move better and more strategically and even view their music different. You know what I'm saying? Like just view their music and music career different. And I do wish more artists like Jason Derulo would come out and just blatantly say like, hey bro, this music check was cool. I maybe made 10 million, 20, whatever, you know what I'm saying? But this shit over here, <laughs> this car wash, this energy drink, you know what I'm saying? This, this, nice. this fucking weed brand I got, this is where the real money at. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. I mean, look, that's all I can say to that, man. Like, I, I agree with that point. Um, this is yet another episode. But real, real, real quick, don't let Ja'Cory spread the fake news. I'm not in love with the AI. <laughs> you know what I mean? I love machines. It's automations, right? Not AI. Is that any better? Uh, I love machines, not machine learning. I like keeping them stupid so we can control them. You know what, <laughs> what I'm saying? This is yet another episode of No Labels Necessary Podcast. I'm Brandman Sean. And I'm Corey. And we out. Peace.